Well, good morning again. I figured uh, you guys, I would assume, uh, are all sitting down today, so I'm going to sit down uh, and try and get a little bit uh, comfortable. We are going to be in our Esther series uh, in the study here that we've been in for some time, and uh, if you have a Bible at home there, I'd encourage you to have it out uh, because we're going to be studying together Esther chapter 4. So if you want to be getting that out and turning to Esther chapter 4, again, if you were here, I would tell you that, uh, that we have some Bibles in the back tables there. Uh, but in all, seriously, all seriousness, uh, if you do not have a Bible at home and you need one, let us know. We'd love to be able to get you one of these uh, to, to be able to read on your own. Of course, you're, you're welcome to use the online campus there. There's, a, there's a, a, a Bible portion of the screen there. So if you're watching on your computer, uh, I think even on your phone, you can get to Esther chapter 4 pretty easily right there on the online campus. So it's just a good thing. We've been studying this book for a few weeks now. We've been studying kind of one chapter at a time. And what we're trying to do is discover how we can live in the kingdom of God when God seems silent, uh, when God seems uh, uh, disappearing or, or empty or outside of our, of our lines, outside the, off the pages of our story, if you will. For Esther, we said, was one of the, is the only book in the scriptures where God is not mentioned directly. He, he is not mentioned, he's not moving, he's not uh, on, the, on the pages, he's not covertly, or he's not overtly out there. We, we see him, as we've said already, kind of behind the scenes, working in his redemptive providence, working behind the scenes to kind of work it out. So we've been studying to try and figure out how can we live in the kingdom of God uh, where God seems silent in our everyday lives, how does that work out? Well, if you haven't been uh, with us, or maybe you have, but just as a way to recap to kind of get us all up to speed here, in Esther chapter 1, we met King Xerxes, and Xerxes was kind of this pompous man who was full of himself and showing off and had this big party that displayed his power and his wealth and everything he had done for the Persian Empire, and then he wanted to par parade his wife in front of his drunken friends, and she, Vashti, she refuses, and so King Xerxes dismisses her, he banishes her, and we find out right there in Esther chapter 1, we find that it's no, sim, small, no small thing to come before the king uh, unannounced or, or to come and to uh, push against the king. Uh, then we find in chapter 2, we're introduced to Esther, who is an orphan Israelite. She was being raised by her cousin, her older cousin Mordecai, and because of her beauty, she was taken to uh, the city of Susa to be in this kind of this understanding of who would become the next queen. She was uprooted from her family, tragically, forcefully taken from her family, and she's taken to the city of Susa. And then we see that she finds favor in the people that are working there, and she finds favor with the king, and she becomes queen. And even in Esther 2, we begin to see the redemptive providence of God that's at work behind the scenes to kind of uh, move about tragic and horrible situations to bring about God's goodness. Then last week, if you're here, we we're in chapter 3, and last week we were introduced to the antagonist in the story, Haman. And we, have, we talked about Haman and his desire to annihilate and kill and destroy all of the Israelites. And, and part of that was because he was holding to these 600-year-old family grudge. And Mordecai was doing the same. And there, this animosity, this frustration, this, this anger between the two kind of festered and fueled into this larger conflict. And then we have this edict that Haman is allowed to, to, to give out that all of the Jews on a certain day, about 12 months later, all the Jews would be killed, annihilated, and destroyed in the, in the Persian Empire. And then we come to chapter 4. And that's where we are today. Chapter 4, we'll see Mordecai's request of Esther to intervene on the Jewish people's behalf. So again, we're going to get into Esther chapter 4. Uh, before we jump in, I'm going to pray and see if God will just teach us what we can learn uh, today together. So let's pray real fast and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Jesus, we come before you humbled and in all that you would teach us. We come before you in your holy word that you would remind us of who you are, of who we are. Uh, and what you're doing through us, and what you're calling us to. So Father, we pray that you would speak to us in your word, uh, and uh, lead us to a life in your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
All right, so Esther chapter 4 is where we are. So if you follow along on the screen or on the, on the screen below or even in your own Bible. So Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuch and female, eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. And when Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So again, let's pause as we've done here in the last couple of weeks and really understand what's going on here in the story. Sackcloth and ashes was a sign of mourning, was a sign of regret, was a sign of, of sorrow. So Mordecai here shows some aspect of remorse. He understands the ramifications of his own stubbornness, his own stuff that has gone on, his own part in this, in this conflict that has resulted in this edict that some 12 months later was going to re- result in the killing and the annihilation of the Jews. So he puts on sackcloth and ashes in mourning. He, he recognizes that his own stubbornness in part has, has caused harm to come and a threat to come to all the people of Israel and he's feeling remorseful, he's feeling sorry. For all that's going on. All right, pick it up in verse 6. Here we go. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for the annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went out, went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then, he, then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has put but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So what's interesting here in this part of the story is that while this edict had gone out all over the province, all the provinces and the whole place of, of the empire, Esther doesn't know about it. Esther doesn't know about it. It's been 30 days since she's been able to be with the king. She's been, she's been able to be in his court since she's been able to understand what's going on. And so she's clueless of what's happening. And when she finally does find out, when she finally is told by Mordecai, she kind of hesitates to do anything about it because she knows what's being asked of her. She knows that if you go to the king uninvited, uninvited that it's a sure death penalty. And she remembers what happened. She remembers the story, at least, of what happened to Vashti when, he, when she refused and when she kind of went against the king's orders. Well, she was banished, and there's only one law that if, it's, if a person comes before the king uninvited, unannounced, if he doesn't extend the golden scepter to them, well, then they die. So she knows what's being asked. She, she kind of feels like finally she's made something of herself. She, she's kind of made it out of being an orphan, out of being the slave, out of being kind of the low, lower rungs of this, of this slave kind of place. And she's finally made herself something. Now she's queen of the whole Persian Empire. And now she's asked by Mordecai to potentially throw it all away. Just throw it all away for someone else. And she hesitates. She's not sure about it. And Mordecai, he has to remind her that while she had indeed accomplished much, she had done a lot. She had found favor with the king. She had found favor with those that were in the harem that were attending to her. While she did do a lot of things, where she was was by the grace of God. And so Mordecai had to remind her that where she was was not simply a result of her own actions. It was by the grace of God. And wherever God moves wherever the grace of God moves it's not just for our benefit it's not just for us we'll get more of that in a moment we'll get getting ahead of myself in the story but 
whenever the grace of God moves us to a place of influence, of leadership, of, of a place that we can do something, well, that grace of God is not just for us. It's not only for our, ourselves and for our benefit. All right, back to the story. Don't want to get ahead of myself too much. So verse, uh, verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Here, Mordecai has kind of given us a little insight or a little glimpse of faith in God's redemptive providence. We've, we've said that before, that God's redemptive providence is his ability to reach into tragic and horrible situations and work them through for the good. And here Mordecai has have some faith in that. He says, God will bring deliverance. God's not going to forget his people, but he's directing Esther to this great promise, this great reality that God is positioning us in, for, in his timing, in his place, for kingdom purposes. God is positioning us for kingdom purposes. So in other words, Esther is not simply in her place as queen for her own benefit. Again, this is not just for herself. The grace of God isn't just for herself. But Mordecai says, who knows? Maybe you've been placed for such a time as this. To participate in the role of what God is doing to bring restorative redemption to the people of Israel in the world. Who knows, maybe God's grace and his redemptive providence is moving in your life in such a way that you have been placed in this to cooperate, participate with work of God and the grace that he would bring to those around him. Who knows? Chapter, uh, or verse 15. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. And then the chapter ends. I want you to notice Esther's desire to gain direction from God here. She, she calls for a fasting and prayer for all the Jews in Susa, and her own attendants will do the same. For three days, night and day, they're going to fast and they're going to pray. And then notice the courage that Esther commits to. I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, even though I know it's potentially a death penalty. And if I perish, I, I perish. But I will do what is needed. I will do what's needed. Now next week we'll get into Esther's request of the king and, and what happens to that request. Uh, but for this morning, I want us to just consider three things that we can see in this chapter, chapter 4, that might help us to live in the kingdom of God. Three considerations as we think about uh, living in the kingdom in our own everyday lives. And the first thing to think about, and that is the imperfections of heroes. The imperfections of heroes. We talked a little bit about this last week, but Mordecai, we'll see, will, will be a hero of sorts in the story. He will be a leader who will help and cooperate with the work of God to, to restore pe the people of Israel and to, read, or to rescue them from sure annihilation and destruction and, and death. But what we're reminded to about, and both in chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4 here, is that he's not perfect. He's not perfect. It's a good reminder that God doesn't use perfect people. I mean, after all, imperfect people is all he's got to work with, right? So God doesn't use perfect people. He uses flawed and, and imperfect people. Are called to leadership, are called to influence, called to be pro proactive and participate in what God is doing in this world. The imperfections of heroes. See, sometimes we're going to get it right. Sometimes we're going to have the courage that we need. Sometimes we're going to say the right thing to the right person at the right time. And, and sometimes we're going to get it wrong. Sometimes we're going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. Now what this chapter reminds us is that even when we don't always get it right, God is still able to use us. God is still able to redemptively, providentially work through us. 
What we see in Mordecai here at the beginning of chapter 4 is a key quality in the person being able to be used in the kingdom of God. And that is the quality of remorse. Humility and remorse. To recognize his mistake. He clothes himself in sackcloth and in ashes. He doesn't go on pretending that he's perfect. He doesn't pretend he's innocent. He doesn't pretend that he's done everything right and it's Haman's all his fault. But he goes out and he weeps and he mourns. He puts on sackcloth and ashes. Esther comes and says, put on some different clothes. Stop doing that. It's not all your fault. It's not all that. And, she, and he recognizes his own part in it. And he refuses to just ignore his part of it. What the people of God, what the kingdom of God needs in the church and in our place in particular is not more people pretending to be perfect, pretending to have it all together, but people who are humble enough to readily acknowledge our mistakes. When we've made mistakes, when we've said the wrong thing. To not blame others, to not excuse them, but people who own their own stuff. People who are readily recognizing their mistakes, readily recognizing their imperfections. Those are the kind of people that can be used for kingdom purposes. Those are the kind of people that are positioned to cooperate with the Spirit of God to to further His kingdom in this world. It's the imperfections of heroes in the Scriptures that God is able to redemptively, providentially use our imperfections for His glory. But we don't excuse them. We don't pretend that they're not there. We readily recognize them. We own our stuff. And we remorse in remorse, we humbly regret them and we apologize for them. Second thing I want to notice in this chapter here is the purpose for blessing. It's the purpose of blessing. Mordecai's instruction to Esther was perhaps you've been put in this position. You've made it to queenship for such a time as this, for this blessing. In other words, the blessing that you've received, Mordecai says, the blessing that you have is given for a purpose. A blessing from a biblical sense, blessing is only a blessing when it flows through you, not just to you. Blessings from a a biblical sense, from a scriptural sense, is a blessing when we see it flowing through us to somebody else, not simply to us. In the book of Genesis, Abraham is told by God, I will bless you, and through you all nations will be blessed. In the Newer Testament, Jesus calls his disciples, and he says, through you, all these kingship, all the kingdom is going to grow through you. A blessing scripturally is only a blessing when it works through us. A blessing wherever we have given has been given for a kingdom purpose to point other people to the goodness and the grace and the power of God's kingdom. And somewhere along the line, Esther misdiagnosed the goodness of God to her. Somewhere along the line, she misdiagnosed the fact that God had been good to her. He had blessed her. He had raised her up. He had sought favor over her, and she'd become queen. And somewhere along the line, she misdiagnosed it, and she thought that was all for herself, that she was blessed for herself, that it was good to reach this place that she was, and she thought it was for her. See, when Mordecai first brought up this idea to her, this issue to her, her response was, in some respect, what does that have to do with me? I mean, I've come up out of that. I've made myself something. I, I've had to do the work. Look what I've had to do. And again, while it's true, she did some things. There were some things she had to accomplish. There were some things she, that was her responsibility to do. But when you look back on her life, when we can look back on her life, we'll see that she's not merely the product of her own personal ambition and her personal responsibility, but we see the redemptive providence of God in her life at work. Can I suggest that the same is true for you and for me? That sometimes we like to think that our lives are the product of our own hard work and our own ability, our own sacrifice, what we've had to do. And and for sure, there's things that we've had to do. There are sacrifices that we've had to make. There's personal responsibilities that we have had to do. But if we would recognize and we look back on our life, who we are and where we are, is by the grace of God. That we are in the positions that we are in by God's redemptive providence. 
We can see his hand. If we look with the eyes of faith back on our life, had it not been the grace of God, had it not been the redemptive providence of God, then you would not be where you are today. And I wouldn't be where I am today. And I want to make a suggestion for us this morning that one of the indicators that we have forgotten that we are the recipients of God's grace in our life is that we are not always that concerned about how others are going to make it. We're not all that concerned about how others are going to fare or what's going to happen with them because after all, we've taken care of ourselves. One of the indicators that we have forgotten that we are the recipients of God's grace is our, our hearts are not so concerned with how other people are going to respond or how they're going to fare, what's going to happen to them. Esther's response at the beginning is, what does that have to do with me? She forgot the purpose of her blessing. And can I tell you this morning that the purpose of your blessing, the purpose of God's blessing and his work in your life is that it would flow through you to someone else, to someone else. Whenever and however God blesses you, it is to be used for kingdom purposes, not only for you, not only for me, but is to be flowing through us to bless another, to bless someone else. And I want you to think back. Take this little mental exercise for a second. Think back on your life and think, how am I going to use the gifts, the talents, the resources that I've been blessed with to advance God's kingdom, to be concerned about other people, to not just think that the blessing stops with me, but to realize that, biblically speaking, a blessing flows through me for kingdom purposes. How are you going to use the gifts, talents, abilities, resources that God has blessed you with for kingdom purposes, for his sake? Well, that brings me to the third thing I want to consider this morning, and that is the importance to be in tune with God. The importance to be in tune with God. We're told to Esther, when she hears from Mordecai and she begins to gather up some courage and she recognizes the redemptive providence that has put her in the place that she is for such a time as this, the decision is made to fast and to pray for three days. For three days. And if you don't know, you don't want to know what to do with your blessing and you're not going to know what God's going to want to do through you unless you gain discernment from God. Oftentimes we think about the blessings, we think about the things that God has given us or blessed us with, and we, we make decisions that seem pretty rational, things that we want to do with those blessings. But there are times, there are times when God is calling us to use our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our resources in ways that are maybe stretching us, ways that are uncomfortable to us at times. For Esther, it meant to go before the king uninvited. But before we make a decision on how we're going to use our gifts, talents, abilities, resources of, that God has blessed us with to be a blessing, to let it flow through us, it's an important step to be in tune with what God wants to use us with, what he wants to do with us. There's an important step of fasting and praying to spend three days to fast and pray, as Esther does. But also notice, not only does she in tune herself with the Spirit of God, what God is calling her, but she calls for the role of community. She calls all of the people to fast and pray with her, for her. She calls all of the Jewish people in that city, and even her attendants are going to fast and pray to seek courage and discernment to how is she going to use the blessing that God has given her that it would flow through her. To find the courage to be a blessing takes a collective effort to pray and to seek godly counsel and wisdom and to pray and fast, to be in tune with God. So things to consider from this chapter here, that the imperfections of heroes, that God can use imperfect people like you and like me, and that the purpose that he has blessed you is to be a blessing, to flow it through you, but there's an important role to be in tune with God. How does he want it to flow through you? What does he want to do through you, through your gifts and talents and abilities? What does he want from you? How do you know that? Well, I want to give you a couple of assignments this week to hopefully help kind of go in that direction and understand how does this blessing work through me and how can I walk as an apprentice to Jesus and in his kingdom in my everyday ordinary life. I've got three of them for you this week. Three of them. And the first assignment for you this week is to recognize your blessings. 
Recognize the gifts, talents, abilities, resources that God has blessed you with. That God has blessed you with. Now, before you write me off and blow me off, I know you're online, but I can still see in my mind's eye thought bubbles popping up all over your heads, and you're thinking, I mean, I'm no queen. I mean, Esther obviously was blessed. She was a queen. She had this large palace. She had a large house. She had all this stuff. I don't have any of those things. I don't have an advanced education. I don't have any influence. I don't have all these things. Before you get all crazy and make excuses of all the blessings that you think you don't have, can I tell you something? If you've got breath, you've been blessed. If you've got breath in your lungs, you've been blessed. And how are you going to use this life and the gifts and the talents and the resources that God has blessed you with today to allow it to flow through you and be a blessing to others? To bless others and to love others in the name of Jesus. And while you do that, you point them back to the giver of all blessings. You point them back. We cooperate with God. When we do this, we cooperate with God to see his kingdom come. We see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe it's a financial blessing that you've been given. Maybe it's the blessing of, of hospitality where you have this blessing of a place where you can welcome people into your place. Maybe it's the blessing of listening to other people. You have a, a gift of listening really well and hearing with your heart. Maybe you have the gift of mentoring. Now, I don't know what your gifts and your talents and your abilities are, but I do know they've been blessed to you. They've been given to you for a purpose. Not simply for you, but that it would flow through you, that you would use whatever gifts, talents, abilities, resources that God has blessed you with to actively bless those around you. So make a list of your blessings. Consider where your blessings are. Second assignment for you this week, seek to be in tune with God. Seek to be in tune with God. See, the only way you're going to know how God's going to want to bless you and to bless through you is if you seek to have discernment and to know what God is calling you to. So I'm going to ask you to do this week, maybe later on this afternoon, that you write down, figure out your blessings, talents, abilities, resources, gifts that you've been blessed with, and then spend a couple days this week praying and asking for wisdom how God would like to bless others through you. How the blessing that God has given you is to be flowing through you to bless and to love someone else. And again, I don't know what your gifts and talents and abilities, so I don't want to be too prescriptive for you. But I simply want to invite you to pray for discernment. To spend a couple days this week praying and even perhaps fasting to seek godly wisdom to say, God, how are you going to use this gift to be a blessing to others? Maybe invite another person. If you're married, maybe invite your spouse. Maybe invite a close friend to say, I have this gift of, of mentoring or this gift of listening or, or this gift of hospitality or whatever it is, and I'm not sure how God wants me to use that. Would you pray for me this week? Because I'd like to seek God's wisdom. I'd like to be in tune with God in this way this week. And if the call seems something a little crazy, if the Lord is stirring in your soul and in your spirit and it, it seems a little bit out, out there and he's going to stretch you a little bit, well, trust in his goodness. Trust in his redemptive providence and walk with courageous obedience to be a blessing this week. This week. Third assignment for you this week, and that is to read Esther. I know, I say that every week, right? Picking up a theme here that every week we're going to read through all ten chapters of Esther. And I want to give you an insight of one of the reasons that we're trying to do this. There was a recent study that had come out that was trying to understand discipleship and trying to understand growing in God's kingdom, growing in God's uh, favor, and understand your spiritual life. And this recent study came out that regularly reading the scriptures, like three to four times a week, had significant impact on our life. It increases our trust and confidence and our obedience to what God would have us do. It increases our confidence in sharing our faith with others around us. It increases our, our ability to, to walk with faith rather than fear or trembling with what's going on around us. 
among a whole lot of other things, this aspect of just simply immersing ourselves in the Scriptures three to four times a week, not just on Sunday where we listen to it, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on, that we would immerse ourselves. So read Esther again. Maybe read a couple chapters a day. Maybe read it all two or three times this week. But read through it again and just see what God is stirring in you and how it may encourage you to be more courageously obedient to his call in your life. So read it again. Understand your blessing. Stay in tune with God this week. Pray and maybe even fast. Call another person in to seek wisdom of how God is going to use the blessing he's poured into your life to flow through you. And let's immerse ourselves in the scripture of Esther and to see what God's going to teach us individually and collectively. Well, each week we've been uh, closing these services with a time of reflection and confession, a time where we think about a person in the story and how our life coincides with that, and then maybe a time of confession. It's an area that we need to uh, tell God and to uh, confess before him. And we've said this before, but confession is not something we do that's not very easy for us to do, but it's necessary in our spiritual life. If we're going to take steps in the spiritual life, confession takes a a significant role there. And we've looked at the person of Vashti, and we've looked at Mordecai and and others in this story so far. But this morning, I want to look at, at Esther and the courage it took to do something and to be ready to do something difficult. I'm going to ask us to think about our own life. When we knew what was the right thing to do, we knew that there was a right thing to do, to say or to go, but it was going to be challenging. It was going to be difficult. And rather than doing the right thing, rather than having the courage to do the right thing, the difficult thing, we opted for the easy road. We opted to kind of withhold from the right thing. And if we're honest... It's in those times when we maybe even doubt God's goodness. We doubt that God is going to be faithful in those times. We're we're doubtful that God will work it out. It's a challenging thing before us. It's going to take courage, but we aren't quite sure if we can trust God. We aren't quite sure if we want to take that courageous step of obedience, and so we, we don't. We recoil, and we take the easy road. Well, I'm going to give us just a moment of, of silent reflection to think of a time when God was stirring in you to do the courageous right thing, even though it's difficult. And maybe you recoiled. It's just a time to confess that before God. God, I know that you are stirring me to do this. And I, I took the easy road. Would you forgive me? Would you restore me? And would you lead me to new ways? So let's take a few moments and then we'll have this responsive song to end our time together.